Can you understand me? <laughs> okay, well, it, it could get worse. <laughs> or I could make it worse. And you might actually want it worse. Um, but what I want to do, is, we're, going to, we're going to showcase tonight some of the things that uh, we have developed since we acquired Van Allocate. But I think it's quite important maybe to give you uh, a kind of potted history of how we've arrived at this particular experience and maybe understand a little bit what is happening in the whiskey market and indeed the single malt uh, market. I've been in the industry probably for about 45 years. I was born in a whiskey town in Scotland called Dumbarton, so it was almost inevitable that I would end up somehow working in the whiskey industry. And it was probably also inevitable that it would start with Ballantines, who are a fantastic company, I have to say. But I was a chemist, I studied chemistry at Glasgow University, so it didn't all start at whiskey, it started with pharmaceutical chemistry for a while. And I have to say, uh, whiskey is a much better analgesic than some of the other ones we were trying as, as, <laughs> uh, as, as, as a chemist. Um, so the journey started with Ballantines, and in these days, and the changes that have been made in the industry are really, really important, and they affect consumers as well. And they will continue to affect consumers because of the consolidation. But in these days, there were hundreds of, well, maybe not hundreds, but there was a huge number of whiskey companies and small whiskey companies. Uh, Ballantines is one of the bigger ones, and at that point, and that's 40 years, 45 years ago, they had no interest in, uh, in developing single malt. That was down, frankly, that was down to William Grant with Van Fittich. And it, it may surprise you, they had some wonderful distilleries there. They had uh, Burgay, Milton, Duff. They even, as it turns out, everything goes in a full circle. They actually owned um, Bendronach for a while when I was there. They had bought William Teachers. So I kind of knew the, the kind of uh, personality of, of that distillery. Anyway, that journey came to an end and I decided to go and ferment uh, um, penicillin for a while. Um, and I have to say that was a much bigger challenge than fermenting alcohol. Uh, and as it, as it turned out, the challenge proved too much. So I decided to move on to Inverhouse who again, they were a very interesting company, very exciting company in our house at that time. They were owned by an American company called Publica and they were all crazy, they were nuts. Um, they, they were totally focused on blended whiskey and at that point they had, you may, I don't know if MD is long enough to remember Glenn, Glenn Flagler. Um, yeah. um, and if you have, if you can get a bottle of Glenn Flagler now, get it because it is gold dust. Um, <laughs> Anyway, they, for a very short period of time, they acquired Bladnock, which was a beautiful location, Bladnock, and a very interesting whiskey at the time. Uh, anyway, I decided that uh, there was too much craziness going on in, in the house, and I moved to a very small company called Burn Stewart, and they were a very, very small company then. And after a few years, we were able to buy the company, which was a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not sure. Um, but during that period, we acquired Deanston Distillery and rehabilitated it. We then acquired Tobermory and, and rehabilitated it. And at that point, the market for single malt was beginning to really get quite frothy and, and exciting. And, and in parallel with all of that, uh, Len Fiddick had appeared, Ben Morgan had appeared, McCallum had appeared, maybe even Aberlour, um, and then Fast was making an interesting uh, uh, run on the outside. Um, so the, that's really when it's maybe 25 years ago, single malt became very, very sexy. And the big companies, and I have to say, I'm not sure they even have woken up to it yet, and I'll come back to that. But anyway, um, Burn Stewart was a very, very interesting experience, but it had to, that had to come to an end as well. Um, Angostura, the rum company, decided that we were worth acquiring. And we thought they were crazy because we didn't think we were worth anything, frankly. But they, they bought the company anyway. So that kind of left me in limbo. And I don't know what kind of the psychology of people in the room is, but you really need to wake up in the morning with a purpose. And if you've been in whiskey, it's really not a job. It's kind of, you're lucky, you know, if you're working in something that is fantastically interesting. Um, so. And I have to say, when we bought Benriac, we had to do something. So a couple of 
friends who, who live in Cape Town, very clever guys and very, very interesting and nice people. We decided we would buy a distillery and we talked to Shivers and they said, Ben Neach, uh, Capper Donich, Alter Bain, Brazen, we're going to live it, take your pick. <laughs> and, and there were 20 distilleries, uh, 20 maybe even more than that, were mothballed at that time. So that was just before, <coughs> that was about 1998, 1999. We bought it in 2004, take it back. And what's happened to the category in that period is almost unbelievable. It's just exploded. And th this brings to another, and I will come back to this point, because that's a big problem for Shivers and Diageo, who are so focused on protecting Johnny Walker uh, range and the Shivish Regal range, they can't get totally involved in single malt because it would it would damage, unquestionably, it would cannibalise a lot of the things that are happening uh, in, in the blended side of the market. Anyway, to truncate everything, we decided that Ben Meek was quite an interesting purchase. And much of that was to do with the inventory. You know, it was a terrific balance of inventory. We had stuff going back to 1976. And I have to say, if there's any in the room with a bottle of uh, Ben Riek 1976, keep it, because that is a, the most fantastic product. And it's, one, it's the best we've ever experienced. We didn't make it, we inherited it, but we, cu we, we cultivated it. Um, we then, surprisingly, when Drona came along and uh, it was kind of a no-brainer, it was a great distillery, kind of knew it anyway. The, the, the crazy thing is, why did, why did, why did Schiffer sell it? It was, um, anyway, did. And uh, it was another very interesting journey. We, we kept pushing the boundaries back. Um, we realised that in, in the old days, when William Teacher owned Lindronach, it, it was one of, it would be the top six single malts, but a very small, a very small category. And it was always uh, matured in cherry cast. So we completely went back to cherry cast and it worked. And I think the brand is doing okay now. Um, <laughs> the, we then acquired the glass. I, I suppose in many ways, that was my biggest dis dis disappointment in the pre with the previous uh, collection of the cellars because we'd done some amazingly good stuff in terms of wood management. We just didn't get a chance to take it to the market before Brown Foreman came along and kind of said, look, you guys need to go, so I can bugger off. Um, anyway, suddenly I was in another position where I had no purpose. We, we need to do something. So I had a conversation with, uh, with Shivas, um, with an MD, who a good guy, a really nice guy, and I said to him, sell me Scarpa. <laughs> and you know, I said, Billy, it's the fourth time you've asked me in 10 years to sell me Scarpa. Um, and actually, he was interested this time. And the deal was that I would take 75%, he would take 25%, or they would take 25%. And we would take it through routes to market. It wouldn't go to the multiple retailer. We would take it through people like Tom, all the private independent uh, import of distributors, retailers. That's the market where you can actually build a brand. Because these guys don't build brands anymore. They manage brands. They, they take ownership of big brands and they manage them. He liked the idea and uh, he went to the French board and they said, no, 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 we, we've got plans for, for Scarpa. And I said to him, look, what wrong. This is the fifth time you've said to me, you've got plans for Scarpa. I tell you, I'll tell you in 10 years time, can I buy Scarpa? And you'll say, you've got plans for Scarpa. But the, the outcome was that they said, okay, but we will sell you one allocate. And uh, so that was great. And I mean, I, I actually knew Bernalaki quite well. Um, the, the important thing in any acquisition of a distillery is that you get the right mix of inventory and indeed enough inventory. And we had a look at it and we thought, hmm, this is quite interesting. Um, and it kind of fitted the template because it had never really been in the market. It had never been exposed. There was no bad news, there was no good news. Um, so it was kind of our our formula, we can make this work. Um, so we said, okay, we'll buy it. And uh, here we are, two years on. And what we're, what we're trying to do, and hopefully through the tasting you'll see this, we want to give the distillery the opportunity to express itself. Finally give the distillery its own personality, its own DNA. Um, I've spent, I can't tell you how many days, uh, 
we, we, we got something like 25,000 casks and we got to the point of, I think, we started in 1978 evaluating, we're now back at, we've, got, we've reached 2012, so we've still got to go between 2013 to 2016, but we're well on the journey, so we know, we kind of know the fingerprint of all the casks that we buy, we know what we want to do with it, we know what wood we want to manage it into, and Certainly in the core range here. In fact, you did it all the all the whiskies here. You're going to see the kind of product of some of the things we've done in the last uh, couple of years. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the story to date. You're awfully quiet, but please encourage me. Ask questions, and I will do my best to give you an answer. Very, very well. So. <laughs> I think yes. we're going to do this in 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 in, in two fours. We're going to do four yeah. and then have a rest and do another yeah. four. So the first the first three we're going to do are the twelve year old, the fifteen year old, and the twenty five year old. The first two, the twelve and the fifteen, are unquestionably the style of whiskey that uh, is going to represent Lenarchy now and in the future. Um, and what I will say to you, I'm very very happy with the quality that we've achieved here, but it's not the end of the journey. The journey will continue. I was saying to this gentleman that, I mean, the, the, the kind of ultimate objective of any blender or any whiskey owner is, is, to, is to achieve perfection. Uh, and you might get to 90% reasonably quickly. The last 10% is the ultimate, uh, it's the prize of the gods, and that's the kind of territory we're working in. Um, so, so, shall we start with number one, which is the twelve-year-old? And one of the one of the one of the challenges and problems of a small company is that, as well as being the blender, I am tasked with the tasting notes. And everybody in any company in a whiskey company hates doing the tasting notes because actually defining a taste is so difficult. But what I will do is I will give you a step for a hint. And then I'll tell you what I read. The makeup of this, uh, the makeup of this particular um, expression is 65% PX casks, 25% Oloroso, and 10% Appalachian Virginal. Um, and there are the, the PX will deliver the colour and the kind of sherry sweetness and the dark chocolate. The Oloroso will give you the spices, the raisins, and the sultanas. And the virgin gives you butterscotch and vanilla. And if you combine these, it should be quite a fulfilling experience. Anyway, let's see if you can resonate with any of these. Slander. So this is the core range. This is the core range. So this is the same that you presented in a, in a video on YouTube with someone called Richard, but I don't know who is Richard Beatty. Beatty, okay. Look, and, and this is a core range. This is, this is where we are with this uh, expression right at this moment. I can tell you in a year's time, in two years' time, the journey will continue. As I said earlier in the evening, you buy a ticket for the train, and maybe you're on the express train, but it's likely you are on the scenic route. No, no, it's not. It's uh, and it's not finishing. It's just wood management, but it, it will continue to get longer and longer. And I'll give you an example of something that's been in a sherry cask all of its living life. But you know, with all casks, and, and this is just a blender's experience, very rich casks you can overcook. You just have to be careful that one particular flavour uh, doesn't actually take ownership of the whole experience. And that, that's the talent of a blender. Sometimes it's not, of course, but... <laughs> so when you took over like the 25,000 casks from the energy, how, how much was... Uh Bourbon casks, and how many were actually sherry casks? I would have said about 80% of the inventory would have been in uh, fresh American casks. But that's a very good start in life because fr fresh American casks don't overcook the whiskey. 
it's a much slower process than putting it into a very rich, like a virgin cask, or indeed some of these big, big sherry, sherry casks. So you bought a lot of new sherry casks like PX and other Rosso to make these new expressions? <laughs> Don't you see the money lines? <laughs> we bought, we bought, literally bought hundreds, maybe thousands of them. And these sherry casks cost something like 850, 900 pounds a shot. So it's a big, like it's running it, running it and owning a distillery is a bit, the biggest challenge you have is managing cash and, and, and being patient. Don't, don't take it to the market too soon. Uh, find a, a much more friendly bank to help you. So if speaking it, about cash, how much uh, money you will spend on cash each year? Oh, certainly a million pounds. Sorry? A million. A million, yeah. each year. Each year. So, um, did sherry cars become more expensive in the last few years? Because it seems that the sh very heavy, dark sherry whiskies have become more um, in style. Yeah, I think, I think that, that, that for the moment they're in style. And the, 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 the problem is that once they become in style, they become in style for everybody. And the demand, the, 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 the demand just becomes exponential. But what happens with sherry casks is, um, I mean, they don't make a lot of sherry these days, but they make a lot of sherry vinegar, mm. and so they they season the casks with uh, with sherry um, for maybe a couple of years, and that extracts the very bitter tannins from the wood, um, and they take that sherry and they will ferment it and convert it into sherry vinegar. They then put fresh sherry into the casks and season again, having removed the kind of rough edges of the of the tannins, and they'll be in there for two, three years, and then we take the casks, and that sherry goes for, for drinking. But it, they will become they will become increasingly more expensive. Is there a big difference between seasoned sherry casks and mature sherry casks in what they do to the whiskey? What a challenging question. <laughs> <laughs> the I have to say, <laughs> look, as with most things, the, the, the process they use uh, now is a very well controlled process. And the, the, whatever your expectation is from these casks, they will deliver. Historically, the older casks were less well managed uh, qualitatively and uh, some of them are good and some of them are less. I mean I can tell you we bought we bought eight, 80 casks of 55 year old seasoned sherry and some of them were pretty pretty good and some of them frankly were disastrous. They were inert, there was nothing left in them. And, and that was a very expensive mistake. <laughs> Yes, madam. Why did you decide to change the recipe for the 12 year old bottle? I think the first one gets less sherry influence, but the, the, the second building or the second batch are slightly different and darker. I think, I think you are very observant, <laughs> first of all. The, the formula hasn't changed, the period in the casks has changed, and that will progressively change as we continue to live in the Glenallochy world. Um, my ultimate objective is to have Glenallochy as the most balanced sherry experience in the whole space island. And that's a challenge. So, so it was not that you tried to change the No, no, we knew, we, 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 like from my own Glendronach experience, I knew exactly the formula that would work in terms of quality delivery. Um, I just needed more time, and, and this is the point I'm making. This is only this is only a point in the journey. I can tell you, if we talk, have a conversation in two years' time, you will be saying, "Wow, this has moved on beautifully." And I think this is a really, really nice product. But my promise to myself, and more importantly to you guys, is that if we have a conversation in two years' time, then Alfie will be spectacular. <laughs> We take you by the word. I'm sorry? We take you by the by word. Thank you. Thank you. You're very trusting. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know what you did with Glenbronach and Glenglasso, so Glenria. <laughs> Look, it, it's, not, it's not difficult. If you set the bar... Well, if you set the bar... 
listen, if you start, the, the formula is very simple. Uh, if you start with a good, good spirit and you put it into good wood, you're going to have, have, have a good whiskey. If you start with a good spirit and you put it into bad wood, you're going to have a bad whiskey. Oh. And if you start with bad whiskey and put it into good wood, you're going to have a bad whiskey. So if you get it right, you'll get it right. Getting it perfect, getting the last 10% is the ultimate prize. And that's where we're working at the moment. But you are very observant. You're a very different customer. Would you say that you have achieved those last 10% no. at some point in Glenzonic history? Sometimes. And, and this, is a, this is the interesting thing about whiskey. Every individual cask has its own personality. You know, you could take two identical casks, you can place them in the warehouse next to each other, so the microclimate, the microclimate is absolutely identical and they will be different. So you, it is being, you have to be really intimate with the whiskey. You have to live the experience all the time. You've got to be talking to the whiskey. I mean, I'm not talking, I'm not Prince Charles, but um, you need to be, you, you need to be interfacing with the whiskey and then you will get it right. And, and at then Drawers, we got it nearly right most of the time. So you, uh, with Glenanic, you decreased production pretty drastically yes. after you took over. Do you plan to not that up again no. over the years? No. No. And the reason is that um, we see a huge advantage. Look, we've inherited a production regime that was appropriate for the previous owners. We, we've moved from, uh, from relatively short fermentation periods to long fermentation. Sorry. Um, so, you know, a fermentation time are about 160 hours now. And why, you might ask why. Well, we're pretty convinced that there is more flavour development over that period of time. But there's another advantage that when you take the wash to the stills, they are almost inert. There's no activity. So it's a much calmer distillation. Um, and there's a lot of other things we'll do. We'll look at uh, yeast variation. Currently, we're using, a, like most of the industry, we're using a mix of uh, brewer's yeast and uh, and distillers yeast. But we'd quite like to look at some wine wine yeast, top dressing of some wine yeast, maybe some champagne yeast. Uh, but that'll take some time to evaluate. But it'll be fun, mm -hmm. and we will monitor the progress along the way. Really, with the yeast to your standard, will change significantly from today into ten to twelve years. I think in, te in 10 to 12 years you will see something that has the same personality, but hopefully we will have achieved the final 10%. When you took uh, over Glenbrook, you also changed quite a lot of the bits and pieces regarding the distillation. Now you can see the standard range is being brought to the new, uh, I mean the new 18 year old will soon come up. Did you ever really, uh, for yourself, Compare the old with the new? No, no. I, I think uh, that, 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 that would be that would be too painful. We might have made it better. <laughs> My suspicion is that uh, they 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 will maybe take cut short cut, take some shortcuts that we would uh, that we that we would take. Um, look, they're engaging with a different market. Their market is less. Their market at the top of the house, they, 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 they are selling into the multiple retailers who are notoriously unpredictable. I mean, this kind of audience is the kind of audience that we want to engage with. Private independent retailers, you guys will go and you will seek out products. You'll be interesting, inquisitive. We want inquisitive people. Um, because we will do things, we'll do some interesting things along the way. and. Uh, Maybe we can talk about some of the wood things that we're planning and indeed have already put in place. Anyway, going back to the original question, do you, did you resonate with any of these flavour characteristics? <laughs> <laughs> or more importantly, did you like it? Yes. Yes.